we might get underway, if we could, for our last panel of the day. Now, you've listened to a bunch of Australians talking about Australia for the past uh, three sessions, and we thought it might be an interesting thing to do to uh, ask uh, some non-Australians, some close observers of Australia who are not Australian, to reflect on how Australia is travelling in today's world. So who better to call on than, uh, than members of our wonderful diplomatic community here in Canberra, uh, members of our community, may I say, that um, we are most grateful to at the ANU and the Coral Bell School. They are wonderful supporters of our work and wonderful interlocutors uh, of our scholars in, uh, in talking about the world. And even better, who better to uh, think about Australia and tell us about how Australia is travelling in today's world than Australia's mm. three closest neighbours. <laughs> and so uh, I have three excellencies here on stage uh, with me. To, uh, to my immediate right is uh, High, Commi High Commissioner Chris Seed, who is the uh, New Zealand High Commissioner to Australia. Uh, to his right is His Excellency Ambassador Najib Ripat Kusuma, who is Indonesia's Ambassador to Australia. And uh, to his right is His Excellency High Commissioner Charles Lapani, who is Papua New Guinea uh, Papua New Guinea's High Commissioner to Australia. Now, uh, this, I, I've been looking forward to this session all day. Uh, in the spirit of Nick Farrelly, please do keep on uh, tweeting away and uh, letting people know what you think of uh, their, their Excellency's judgments on Australia. Now, Excellencies, I'm going to ask each of you at the outset to give Australia uh, a traffic light be it a green light that Australia is doing well and getting better, be it a red light that Australia is not doing well and getting worse in travelling in today's world, or an amber light that generally we're, we're doing okay and we're not getting much better or much worse. Now, I'd like each of you to spend a couple of minutes thinking about that and making a few remarks and then we might open up into a, a broader discussion. So, who would like to start? <laughs> Might have to be the dean of the team. <laughs> Curious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris, <clears throat> Mike, um, and the um, <clears throat> distinguished um, uh, participants of this gathering this afternoon. Um, uh, I was approached by Mike just a few days ago <clears throat> to participate in this gathering. Sorry about my voice. I've just risen out of the death of um, gra uh, grasp of uh, flu, so forgive me if you can't hear me properly. Um, Papua New Guinea and Pacific uh, region uh, and our relations with Australia. PNG first. Uh, we uh, are a former colony of Australia, as you know, one of the only two probably. I don't know what you can call Nauru, but uh, Papua New Guinea was a colony, the first colony that you have attempted to colonize, and uh, generally I can say you did a pretty good job as colonialists uh, in the times that uh, uh, you were there as uh, Australian colonialist administrators. Things have changed, of course. <clears throat> I was just um, at high school in Charters Towers, a uh, class of 66 who graduated in high school a long time ago, but um, we had a reunion and I was uh, asked to reminisce and reflect as well. First, most important highlight of my attending a school in Charters Towers was, um, even some of you may not know where this place is, you Australians. Um, but I arrived on this Fokker friendship flight turboprop in those days from Port Moresby to Townsville. And I was scared to get out. I was the last passenger and the stewardess came and said, uh, you have to get out here. This is where the flight terminates. I said, well, where are some black people to see me out? You know, can't expect white people. 
Uh, I see white people carrying baggages, which we don't see in Papua New Guinea in those days. Manual work is for us natives. So uh, this is Australia. You can get out. And even when I was put in my steps in trepidation, uh, foot, feet on the, on the steps to get out, I was wondering when the police are going to appear and arrest me. Uh, for making white people work for me, carrying my baggage. So that was a transformation. This was the mentality of most of us Papua New Guineans growing up in your colonial administrating days. Not all that bad, of course. Australia's colonial policy had a lot of good things about it, and most, much of it uh, resonates today, and that is to protect our land. Only 2% of Papua New Guinea land was, was taken over by Crown for Crown purposes, Crown use. So the rest of the land remains today for Papua New Guineans. And that is the saving grace of our process of development, is to own land. Uh, people say, most of you development uh, peddlers, say Papua New Guinea is poor out of poverty, insecurity. The regional arc of insecurity, as one of your famous colleagues has uh, pronounced a decade or so ago, uh, this instability would come to Papua New Guinea and the rest of Melanesian group, which is the arc of instability. But uh, there were sort of times when this approached that level, but has never emerged as such, uh, that there was mass killings, mass murders, mass political instability in the country that a lot of other develop, developing countries have gone through after independence. PNG is lucky because we have a neighbor like Australia. We achieved our independence at a time when you had a period of instability. Uh, in your political constitutional history. Fraser was taken over from Gough Whitlam. But at that time, and that is one of the critical issues I want to talk about, how aid contributes to a lot of angst between our two countries, your development assistance. Even at independence, for now, on our part, I was the head of the planning office who manages your aid and uh, uh, puts it into our priority development uh, policy areas that still remain till today, health, education, law and justice, and uh, infrastructure. They're the main ones. Of course, administration and corruption is alleviation of those issues, part and parcel of it. But your aid, uh, Gough Whitlam couldn't convince <laughs> Treasury's uh, stone, as he was known, uh, to relent to giving us, continue to give us aid. His message was if we keep giving Papua New Guinea aid, even this next budget, the country, Australia would go bankrupt, basically. That's his message. So we'd, we had dispatched our people, uh, uh, Ross Garno was one of, the, one of them. He was a first assistant secretary in our treasury. Um, they came down with our Minister of Foreign Affairs and, um, to discuss uh, with, with Fraser, uh, Whitlam, its people, the treasury people, and they said no. And the, the phrase was coined, we are trees, not stones, to reflect how tough your stone treasurer was behaving. But when... Um, Fraser came in, he not only extended the period of aid to three-year period cycle, but he uh, increased the amount. So as a planner, to plan forward of a cycle of three years, we need to have that breathing space because your, budget, your aid was contributing 60% of our budget in those days. Now it's only 5% of, of, of revenues. Now it's only 5%. But 
be that as it may, we, um, Fraser came and gave us this gift. Uh, when I awarded him the logo uh, in, at the mission here in Canberra, I reminded him, I'm Malcolm Fraser, with, with gratitude that, um, of those days. And his first words was, I, I just a lesson here uh, over a lunch with uh, everybody else I invited, including Julie Bishop. Um, first lesson is never listen to treasury advice. <laughs> and at the time when um, mm. Abbott government came in, they were also having difficulty with treasury. So I said in a speech I gave to Deakin University, there must be some, some genetic uh, thing about liberal national coalition and treasury relations. But um, given all that, uh, we have done very well by Australia with your aid, a key cornerstone under the Development Corporation Treaty we signed uh, that underpins our relationship, formally signed in 1989. Um, and uh, it continues till few years ago, it still is there, but there is an economic cooperation treaty now that's supposed to indicate a reduction in your aid to Papua New Guinea, but increase the flow of our trade and investment to recognize and acknowledge the maturity of our relationship rather than a dependency relationship over the years since independence. That treaty has been signed, but nothing, it's, a, it's like a framework arrangement Nothing of substance has come of it for the last three years, uh, well, two years now since Abbott and O'Neill signed, but the treaty was prepared and finalized about three years ago. So we are working to put in the um, meat over the bone, so to speak, as to what that all means in our relationship going forward. Pace plus, we're told by us, Australian friends, that you have to sign, Papua New Guinea, you have to sign, you and Fiji have to sign PESA Plus, which governs our regional trade relations with Australia and New Zealand, before you, we can move to a bilateral arrangement with access to, to markets in Australia for Papua New Guinea. Unfortunately, we find that a very difficult thing to swallow because why should we sign a regional arrangement that has nothing, essentially nothing, for Papua New Guinea and Fiji, the two biggest countries, and yet you hold us to that before we can talk Turkey with you on trade and investment. I have been proposing a, an arrangement with Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Australia, a trilateral economic cooperation group, group for the last five years, that that should be the basis of our maturing relations not asylum seeker boat people. That is a transient issue. I know it's close to the hearts of many of you in Australia and in Papua New Guinea, but it's a transient issue that our Supreme Court has ruled and we're moving forward to Manus is now closed. Asylum seekers are roaming free in Manus. And uh, there will now be, um, uh, uh, there's a roadmap of how to proceed which has been approved by the, by the, the court, Supreme Court. Now, we, we are moving in that direction, but we have a group of about four or 500 asylum seekers in, sitting in Manus. Where do they go? We can't just force them out. Those who are found to be non-serious, uh, genuine uh, asylum seekers, um, refugees, are to be deported. Uh, from our countries. We're talking to our friends in uh, diplomatic missions whose citizens are there to give them the documents to return home. But the, we cannot uh, just force out the refugees that are there. That's the sticking point. Australia doesn't want to take them. Um, the um, the uh, refugee commissioner here stated that uh, it is a difficult proposition there uh, uh, a refugee commission is uh, confronted with, but they will help us verify the refugee status, but that's the extent of the assistance they will give us. So we are stuck with refugees in Manus. Be patient. We're working on solutions to, to relocate them 
and resettle them. But coming back to going, uh, how we should proceed and how Australia is performing, uh, um, you, um, in terms of Papua New Guinea, uh, as I said, there are certain things and events that have uh, railroaded or pretty well sometimes uh, put our relations at, uh, at risk. The, uh, I mentioned one, the uh, Australian uh, assistance and various reincarnations, development, uh, direct budget support at independence, now it's program support. And let me just make sure you understand that all your checks are signed here in Canberra. Uh, you remember at the elections in 2013, Abbott, incoming Abbott government and politicians stand, stood up and said Kevin Rudd was giving blank checks to Peter O'Neill. Mm. There's no such thing. And of course, you know, people have confronted Julie Bishop on that. She admits she was just getting stuck at Kevin Rudd, not to Papua New Guinea or Peter O'Neill. Uh, Samara's shoes issue at Brisbane Airport, Motti Affair, uh, Bougainville, still an issue. Uh, PNG's election of 2012, uh, where Bob Cass thre uh, threatened uh, sanctions, and of course, asylum seekers, uh, um, Supreme Court decision, and Papua New Guinea's uh, continuous uh, 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 advocacy or request to Australia to allow us to enter Australia on visa on arrival terms. We let your people come to Papua New Guinea, arrive at our airports. We stamp the passports to walk into our country, but you can't let us do that. And that's a, that's a sticky issue for us uh, going forward. At official levels, we, we have institutions of, that deal with our uh, bilateral relations, the annual ministerial forum. Leaders meet regularly whenever they, they can, and uh, men for ministerial forums and senior officials meeting. At people-to-people -people level, Kokoda Track Foundation does a great job. Kokoda Track is an iconic uh, um, uh, area in Papua New Guinea, uh, reminiscent of Second World War. Uh, if you ask um, 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 former Prime Minister, um, Labour Prime Minister after Bob Hawke, uh, sorry, my apologies, kidding. He will say Kokoda Track is more important than, than um, the, uh, the um, um, Gallipoli. Gallipoli, sorry. Uh, I was sick recently, so. Uh, but anyway, it, it's very important, iconic uh, place for both our relations and Australia PNG Business Council and all you NGOs doing a great job in supporting Papua New Guinea's development. But as I said, going forward, we should work towards a trilateral arrangement with Australia, PNG, and Indonesia. Uh, pay surplus we need to deal with, why you can't let Papua New Guinea and Fiji bilaterally trade and the investment flows rather than wait till pay surplus is signed. Climate change, why is Australia so obstinate about climate change issues? I want an answer from some of you today, if not from your government. Ramsey, uh, Mike asked me to comment. Ramsey is winding down. Next year, June, they will close the operations, but the re as a region, we are very grateful to Australia for its support. It's a regional effort, but uh, Australia and New Zealand's uh, grateful, uh, we're very grateful for your support in Ramsey, in Solomons, but also in Bougainville on behalf of my government. Uh, we thank Australia and New Zealand uh, and appreciate greatly for, for your efforts. Now, let me close by saying, how are you traveling? Uh, by uh, bike, yeah, you're good bikers. You've won um, two de France ones. Uh, swimming, yeah, you're kind of getting there in the Olympics. Um, by boat, I don't know. I can't leave that. <laughs> to and from Australia, I don't know by boat. We still have visa on arrival issues. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Well, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, professors, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so delighted uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to be here with you all. 
uh, today uh, to talk about, uh, well, uh, I can say it's also about uh, Indonesia-Australia relations. Because uh, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Australia, where, uh, how is Australia traveling into this world? Of course, uh, Australia should uh, traveling together with uh, their neighbors. And as one of uh, the closest neighbors, Indonesia is one of the closest friends also of uh, Australia. Uh, but uh, the relations between our two countries is very unique. Indonesia and Australia is very close to each other. We are uh, not more than uh, 200 uh, nautical miles uh, away, but uh, we are very different to each other, uh, both uh, historical, historically and uh, also uh, uh, culturally. We are so different. So that's why uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult, you know, if you have a di totally different background, uh, to discuss things, sometimes uh, misunderstandings is always there. So that's why I think uh, the only things uh, to uh, make the uh, uh, relations good uh, between the two very close neighbors and very uh, two uh, different uh, families is by uh, dialogue, by talking to each other. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the uh, what is uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, things that uh, are driving uh, the Indonesia and Australian uh, relations. If we look at from time to time, sometimes uh, the people will very uh, easily uh, answer that the uh, relations between the two countries is uh, driven by the uh, uh, situational uh, condition, the, by the, uh, by the uh, tactical uh, level uh, or practical level uh, situation, because uh, if you look at from uh, time to time, you know from the from the independence of Indonesia up to now, so it's uh, it's always up and down. Uh, you look at the uh, confrontasi. The confrontasi is one of the worst uh, relations between the two countries, maybe in uh, early uh, 1960s, where uh, Sukarno at the time said, uh, well, uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, no capitalism, no uh, uh, colonialism, no, and no, n uh, he, he mentioned about uh, everything is no about uh, a Western uh, civilization at that time. You know, and then uh, confrontasi happens. And then we have uh, a lot of other things like uh, the, uh, uh, well, uh, small things like uh, Bali 9 last year. We have uh, East Timor uh, between uh, uh, 1995, you know, 1995 to uh, 2000, maybe. And then we have uh, also uh, the three Bs, you know, like uh, boat, uh, and then we have uh, the uh, 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 Bali bombings and everything, and then we have beef uh, that is uh, cattle, live cattle export. So the three bees is uh, always uh, trying uh, to bring, you know, uh, the direction of uh, the relations uh, to uh, to uh, a kind of uh, 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 area that uh, disputed uh, between us. Ladies and gentlemen, we we have uh, I think. Uh, the uh, the most important thing between Indonesia and Australia is that we make uh, a good uh, uh, not only a tactical not only practical not only transactional uh, uh, relations but we have to make in in a very good frame a policy planning that we have to uh, face uh, uh, together for the future of uh, this region now uh, we have uh, started with what's so called SIPA, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which is, I think, is one of the most uh, important uh, economic uh, uh, negotiations between Indonesia with other countries, except ASEAN, of course. ASEAN, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Indonesia, uh, the ASEAN economic community now. But with other countries, this is the first time that we will have the SIPA. And I know that uh, we are now in the middle of, uh, of the uh, robust, open, and frank uh, discussion and negotiation on uh, SIPA. We are talking about the, uh, about the, uh, 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 about the uh, surface 
We are talking about trade. We are talking about investment. We are talking about the financial uh, service and uh, and uh, we are talking also about the uh, uh, movement of labors, for instance, uh, uh, to, uh, from Australia to Indonesia. We, we try to, uh, to have a very good uh, relations in this, not only as, uh, as I said, as uh, short term and transactional uh, activities, but also uh, for the long term. We have uh, what's so called the Lombok Treaty, the treaty between Indonesia and Australia to discuss about the strategic things, about that we are, we, are, uh, we are going to the right direction. We are shoulder to shoulder in uh, facing uh, so many challenges, uh, strategic challenges and, uh, uh, between the two countries. Our defense forces, for instance, uh, they are very close to each, to each other. The ADF and the, uh, the, uh, the TNI is very close to each other. They send officers. They uh, have uh, uh, from tabletop exercises to the field exercise. They try to, you know, to, to know each other. Even though the, uh, the, maybe the level of uh, advancement, maybe Indonesia is uh, left, a little bit left behind, but uh, uh, we are trying to understand each other. How do we face the, uh, the challenges? How do we face the, uh, the, uh, 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 the threat uh, from uh, outside? Now, uh, we, we also have now the, uh, uh, what's so called, the Council of Ministers for uh, Law and Security. I think this is also very important. We are talking uh, openly about uh, terrorism. We are talking openly about, uh, about counter-terrorism. We are talking uh, openly about the threat uh, from, uh, you know, from extremism. And uh, we are also talking about uh, so many things that could uh, hamper the uh, uh, good uh, relations uh, uh, between the two countries. That is uh, uh, what uh, we are trying uh, to, to do uh, for the future. And uh, for the challenges, I think a lot of challenges that uh, we face uh, together. One of the most uh, important uh, challenges for Indonesia and also I think for Australia is the pressure of demographic uh, pressure. That is, uh, Indonesia now is about 20, 250 million people. The population of Indonesia is uh, very big. It's about 11 times of uh, Australians. And in 15, a year's time, we will be 287 million people. Uh, if you uh, see the, the statistic, the uh, growing of uh, the population growth. So uh, the pressure will be very, very big because the resources is uh, only that, you know, so uh, only uh, what we have right now. And then uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the land area of Indonesia. We have 17,000 islands, very, uh, so many islands uh, across Indonesia. But if you look at the land, uh, it's only one third of the, uh, uh, the big of uh, the Nusantara, the Indonesian uh, archipelagic uh, nations. So uh, the sources is only, so that's why President Jokowi is trying to push the what's so called the maritime policy uh, for the future of Indonesia. This is very, uh, for, very important uh, for Indonesia to see uh, the future uh, uh, with the maritime issues. So that's why we have now uh, trying to build uh, the uh, uh, infrastructure, or maritime infrastructure. We try to, uh, to build new ports and to refurbish the uh, old ports and so on. And we try uh, to accommodate uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, and Australian needs uh, to export their goods uh, uh, to Asia uh, through Indonesia. Uh, we built now at, at least two ports in the eastern part of Indonesia, like Sorong in Papua and uh, Makassar in Sulawesi. So they will be. Uh, two international big ports in this area to accommodate the eastern uh, 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 ports, the eastern coastal ports of uh, Australia, New Zealand, 
and also uh, Papua New Guinea. And so uh, you will have a distribution port over there and it will be open to the 600 uh, million population of uh, ASEAN and uh, 250 a million population of Indonesia. That is uh, one a challenge of, uh, of uh, uh, demography. And then uh, the second challenge is uh, the fast uh, changing uh, region. The region is uh, uh, changing very fastly now. If you look at the, uh, uh, in 2030, Australia and Indonesia will be a region that is much bigger than it is now. Bigger economically, because uh, as, uh, as uh, predicted by, uh, uh, by experts, that uh, in 15 years' time, the uh, household, the, uh, uh, every household of, in, of Australia, which is now have uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, 50,000 uh, uh, of today, will be uh, four, fourfold, yeah? four times uh, uh, become uh, 200,000 in 20, 2030. This will be a very big uh, economy of uh, Australia. And the economy of Indonesia also will be bigger than uh, of today. But uh, that's, of course, it's, uh, we, we should also get a new sources for the, uh, uh, for the uh, and then uh, for, for the students. We have now students in Australia, about 20,000 students of Indonesian uh, students in Australia. And uh, in 2030, there will be more because the Indonesian government now, you know, uh, give also some uh, uh, scholarships to the students uh, to study here. And then, uh, how about the holiday makers? Right now, we have 1.15 million uh, holiday makers from Australia into Indonesia. And I hope that uh, there will be more uh, uh, Australian coming uh, to Indonesia every year. And uh, even if you look at uh, the last two months, the last two months, uh, we are uh, the uh, tourists from Australia uh, going to Indonesia is bigger than the tourists going to New Zealand, for instance. So it's, uh, it's uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are now uh, the biggest uh, destinations of uh, Australian tourists uh, uh, going. And, and my third point is uh, the ASEAN and the uh, Pacific Islands that uh, uh, Charles has mentioned. The uh, ASEAN uh, will be uh, the fourth largest economy in 2045-2050. Uh, uh, and then uh, they need also you know, uh, innovations. They need also the uh, resources of, uh, of innovation. That is, uh, I think, uh, Australia can supply that uh, for uh, ASEAN. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, the situation as a whole. And I hope that uh, within uh, 15 to 20 years uh, in the future, uh, the uh, Australia uh, and Indonesia will, uh, will, will have uh, a new dynamics because we will be a very big economy. As Charles said, that uh, it's uh, very good if we have uh, a triangular uh, economic cooperation, uh, maybe also with New Zealand. You know, uh, that's, uh, that will give us a more uh, uh, a freedom of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, collaboration uh, for the future. And uh, for, the, uh, for the last things that I would like uh, to mention about the uh, 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 traveling of today. Maybe uh, some, uh, some misunderstanding should be uh, discussed uh, properly uh, between the two countries. Some misunderstanding, sometimes uh, uh, unilateral uh, actions uh, taken by one country to another is not very good. But uh, we have to be very, very careful on that. And then we have to discuss with our neighbors because our neighbors is always there, you know, and then we can uh, contact them uh, uh, anytime. And I'm very happy that now we have uh, so many uh, 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 good uh, relations from the top uh, relations uh, between uh, the president and prime minister, for instance, and then uh, among uh, ministers, uh, senior officials, and also 
uh, diplomats and uh, uh, from uh, universities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that uh, the uh, directions of uh, Australia in Asia and Pacific will be uh, better in the future. We are uh, partners, we are part of the uh, future of these uh, regions, and we have to work uh, uh, together very, very closely. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Am I hooked up? I am hooked up. Um, well, uh, it's been a, thanks for the invitation and thanks to Westpac for hosting this. It's been a great, um, a great day and uh, there's nothing like getting a bunch of Australians um, surveying uh, the state of the nation um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it's a, um, it's a sort of um, a, a reminder that uh, no, no matter how um, tough uh, you guys are with New Zealand, um, it's nothing compared to how tough you are on each other. Uh, as you're sort of unpicking the sort of the challenges um, that, uh, that, face, that face Australia. Um, but often, the, you know, the sort of role of New Zealanders and things is to sort of um, actually, um, you know, we, we have to be optimists uh, in our country. Uh, and uh, we think that you've, Australia's actually got lots of reasons why um, it should be uh, uh, optimistic um, as well. And I'm not sure that the optimism piece um, really sort of, um, uh, sort of washed through the day uh, so much. So um, I just thought I'd uh, sort of perhaps run through a couple of the, um, the, the points that we, where we think Australia's travelling pretty well in the world. Um, indeed, why you've probably got um, the sort of pr problems your government, your polity is sort of dealing with problems actually which a lot of countries wouldn't mind, uh, they wish they were on their uh, to-do list uh, rather than some of the things that they are, um, they are sort of struggling with. Um, uh, and um, so it was, it was really just a sort of chance to talk to that and then I had sort of two or three issues where um, I thought that uh, just sort of running at a ruler against the sorts of things that are um, driving an agenda in New Zealand that... Um, that even, even if you accept some of the debate here about political gridlock, could still be areas of focus um, for, for a government. Not that New Zealanders are actually um, in the business of, sort of providing advice to the Australian government. That's one of the things they teach you on day one uh, when you join the New Zealand Foreign Ministry. Um, we're, we're not in the business of providing advice particularly to Australia. Um, <laughs> It's a good way to shorten your uh, diplomatic career. So, if, I mean, if you sort of think about it in, in broad terms, I mean, a lot of the arguments about why Australia is doing well in the world, I mean, the great sort of shift um, from, uh, from west to east of sort of geopolitical power and economic weight, I mean, Australia is sort of uh, immediately adjacent to that, deeply, you know, integrated in the region. Maybe it needs to be more integrated. There have been arguments about that. But nevertheless, it's in a, it's in a sort of a, a specially privileged position. It's one of the safest and most um, secure countries on the planet. Um, I know Australia is strategically anxious. It's being described as a strategically anxious country. Um, but the fact is, you know, you, you know it's a bloody big continent. Uh, no one's coming to get you. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, you've got um, there's um, you've got enormous you've got, you have both depth and breadth of uh, sort of all sorts of capabilities. Um, the most co one of the most coherent sort of states in the world. Um, you're um, despite um, the uh, what, what the commentary might say, you remain extremely well governed. You have um, you know enormously uh, impressive um, institutions. Um, you can talk about uh, you know your banking system is um, extremely strong. It's such a, a driver for a lot of um, why Australia has such a sort of, a, 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 you know, a future and why it's able to navigate the ups and downs of the world. One of the great um, outcomes, um, well, w w New Zealanders are very conscious of this. One of the reasons we got through the big hit of the Christchurch earthquake, one, um, you know, a 9% hit on our GDP, a sort of a $45 billion um, sort of spend, was because what stood behind it was actually um, Australian financial institutions. Our major insurance um, company went broke. In fact, if anyone was interested in buying one, I could go one to hock off. But what stood behind it actually was Australian financial um, institutions, Australian, uh, pr the pr Australian prudential system. Um, speaks to the sort of power of, the, um, of our single economic market, but it also speaks to the sort of the strength of the Australian institutions. If you want another example about Australia's brand in the world, is extreme remains extremely strong. I mean, I've never, there's never been a lot, a lot of credit, in my view, given to um, 
the way in which Australia um, was voted on to the UN Security Council and the role that it played there. What was extraordinary for New Zealanders was that um, you have to remember that Australia entered the race late. In fact, they jumped in ahead of us. Um, so we were very conscious of that. They entered the race late. Um, you changed prime ministers three times. Um, you changed foreign ministers three times. Uh, the opposition tried to nix you all the way through. Um, and you got up on the first vote um, with uh, 145. I mean, that sort of speaks powerfully to the way in which uh, not only Australia's brand in the world, but their sort of capabilities and competence, not only of your foreign service, but all the other elements that contributed it, uh, to it. Um, uh, I mean, there's obviously the piece about resources, um, but it also in a world which is sort of short of protein, Australia actually produces a lot of that as well. So another reason why diversification is a, and, and, and sort of both in terms of markets and, um, and economic benefit, um, will, you know, would and should flow to Australia. There's a reason Fonterra, um, you know, New Zealand's largest um, sort of economic entity owns 20% of your milk supply. We actually think you're quite good at it. Um, we want to be part of that. <laughs> and we think that, um, that Australia will do well in that space uh, in the world. Uh, you have a remarkable consensus here on uh, foreign and security policy. Um, and, um, you know, the, some of the sort of fundamentals about, um, you know, the frameworks for defence spend, for defence capability, um, ambition for um, your sort of international relationships is extremely um, strong and, um, and, and enduring and it's, and it's, a, it's a, great, uh, a great benefit. So anyway, the, 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 those are just a sort of few things that strike me as you sort of listen to Australians sort of talk about uh, what might not quite be right. Um, but actually much of what you do and the way Australia acts in the world is a force for good and the world actually needs uh, more Australia. Um, in terms of sort of just as thinking of it as a New Zealander and the sorts of things that our country, um, you know, has to navigate, we're, you know, very much at the sort of, you know, once described as at the, uh, I think, arse end of the world, um, you know, a, a, a dagger pointed at the heart of Antarctica. I mean, if anyone's got to um, sort of think about, you know, how you organise yourself in the globe, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's New Zealand, you certainly don't have, we don't bring economic weight um, or, or hard power to issues. Um, and we have to navigate, a, you know, a smaller, obviously a smaller population, smaller skill set, um, thin country, um, you know, three million taxpayers. Um, so, you, you know, you think quite a lot about resource prioritisation and where you put effort. And so when the sorts of things that even if you accept some of the challenges that Australia uh, faces currently, there are a whole range of areas where, um, uh, using a, a New Zealand example, you'd think are ripe for continued um, sort of investment, because essentially they go to matters of public policy rather than, you know, political, rather than legislative change or, um, or um, um, uh, parliamentary uh, management. I mean, one of them is around the budget. I mean, a sense that uh, the, in the modern world, uh, governments own about 25% of the economy. Um, understanding how that works, um, where, what, out, what outcomes it's meant to deliver, um, how you manage that budget. Um, there's enormous sort of power that still that rests in the government that it doesn't require where it doesn't require legislative authority. So there's enormous um, uh, um, benefits to be secured by tackling um, issues, um, a whole range of issues there, which don't require um, the approval of the parliament. Um, the whole the, the settings around how we're integrated in the re, in the region, um, as much as for you, uh, so for New Zealand, you know, we're never going to get wealthy really selling to ourselves. So thinking about how we integrate with um, all that sort of economic um, uh, capability, all that economic um, upswing uh, that's happening in our region, these are the sort of issues which which require continued attention. Um, and require sort of new uh, new ways of thinking. Uh, you know, why have not Australia and New Zealand, for example, sort of, you know, what's the next thing after, um, after uh, the ASEAN sort of CER agreement? Um, it's one of the reasons why New Zealand was, has always been a, was a, a proponent of TPP, and in fact, it's why we would be one of the great beneficiaries out of, a, out of TPP. It's why we, along with you, make the argument in Washington that it's the economic, um, it's the, uh, the other side of the, the pivot, the, the security pivot um, argument in, um, in, uh, in Washington. What's the counterfactual that the world, that our region will be better if, the, if TPP is not signed? 
So making, making those, uh, those sorts of arguments. Um, on migration, that's um, something where it seems to me there's a lot of um, sort of scope for um, the government in here have, getting a more coherent um, um, uh, sort of narrative, I guess. And I think you're seeing it as a lot of publications uh, coming out now about the um, great change uh, in the mix of Australia's um, sort of migration intake and particularly um, that idea about how you, uh, the increasing number of people who are coming on one sort of visa, education, um, 457 visa or temporary school visa, uh, and then the, the, you know, how the country sort of manages that shift into actually people do, they put down roots, they want to stay, they want to commit uh, to this country. And so how the country, how the government here is going to manage that. Climate change has been mentioned, um, mentioned by others. It's a great challenge for, uh, certainly for our, my country as well as yours, because of the sort of special, the peculiarities of our, um, of our profile. Uh, in, in, in New Zealand's case, um, we already have something like 80, 85% of our um, electricity is um, generated by renewables, and then we have this massive other piece, which is um, from, uh, uh, from animal emissions. Um, which um, sort of creates a big, um, a big challenge for us in trying to um, lower emission stands, uh, so lower our emission levels. So anyway, um, just, a, just a, those are a, a few observations. But you know, clearly it is never navigable. And I, the reason I say this is um, you can always incentivise Australians by getting them to, to set, you know, New Zealand can set itself up as if we can do certain things, surely you must. So for a couple of things just off the top of my head, um, so, you know, we've, what we've tried to do, we've had four prime ministers in 26 years. You should try it. It, um, <laughs> it has a lot to recommend it. Um, but not only that, we've, we've had uh, four, four finance ministers in the same period and four foreign ministers. So it leads to a lot of um, policy continuity. And no one could say anything other than that our, I mean, our politics, our, our, the, the architecture that we've designed um, uh, has, um, you know, requ requires... Um, uh, people being able to reach across the, the aisle, if you like, the political aisle. But um, the challenges that we face in doing that are no more than the challenges that, that will be and are faced uh, in the parliament here. It is possible. Um, you, you think about the sort of rec the, the recovery issues that have been driven off, um, off Christchurch, your second largest city taken out of operation. Um, you know, that sort of big hit on GDP, um, sort of reorganising, um, you know, the economy um, to, uh, to service that. Um, you think about uh, Australia's had 25 years, I think it was the figure of, you know, economic growth. We've had three recessions through that, uh, through that period. Um, so you're, you know, the, 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 um, the challenges that w we've had to sort of navigate, use that New Zealand as an example are not, um, you, know, it, it, you know, it can be done and out of the other side of it, um, um, sort of surplus this year and in out years. Uh, unemployment's currently at 5.1%. Workforce participation rate, I saw the other day, we're now fourth in the OECD um, for that. Um, but it's also true that, um, um, you know, what's going on here is, um, uh, is, is, is definitely navigable and definitely manageable. That's why 640,000 of us live here. 12% uh, of the population, so that's a great, um, a great thing to finish, uh, I guess, to say that um, there's, uh, there's nothing like having 12% of your population to live in another country to know that uh, there's a lot of things here that are going very well. Thank you, Excellency. Yeah. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, if anyone had any questions for their Excellencies, uh, ask them a curly question. Uh, get them to test out their diplomatic skills. Brendan. Thanks, uh, Michael. My, my question is for Chris. Chris, good to see you again. And um, I'm sure Michael's um, particularly grateful that you didn't say anything about the state of Australian rugby at, uh, <laughs> at present. It was, it was much appreciated. But um, my question is, is about your observation that um, Australia is a strategically anxious country. I think you're, you're right about that. One of my um, favourite characterisations of the relationship was won by, I think it was Alan Gingell who talked about Australia and New Zealand as being two countries that share the same bed but have different, different nightmares. But if you, um, if you look at, at what's, um, you know, some of the statements that have been coming out of Wellington over the last 12 months about the South China Sea um, and also um, the gradual but I think you know, quite significant warming in the, the New Zealand-US uh, relationship that was seen um, over recent years, I'm wondering whether you see 
um, a gradual um, convergence in, in the New Zealand and Australian strategic outlooks? And if, if so, if you accept that proposition, what do you see as kind of the sources that and, and of that and, and what are the, the potential limits over time to that, uh, that convergence? Uh, well, I think the, I'm not sure, convergence, is that the right word? I mean, I, I think that New Zealand would run in line that we share a, um, you know, a common strategic space uh, with Australia, that, um, of course, we have a, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a formal alliance relationship. Um, um, it was even in the dark days of our um, dispute with the Americans, I mean, David Longy describes, you know, said that New Zealand's interests in Australia didn't end at the Blue Mountains. Um, that um, and so we've often, we, you know, we work together uh, in the in the world because, in a sense, our interests are so uh, uh, intertwined. Even if our um, of, often our approach, or sometimes our approach to tackling issues or to resolving issues, might in, in third um, in third countries or, or in, in other areas might be um, quite, you know, might be different. So. Um, I, th I think too that um, the way in which our two countries have thought about our big relationships with the, with, with China or with the US, um, you know, have in both our cases have evolved over time, and they've evolved to take account of um, the you know what is what is changing uh, in the world. And you use the example of um, our you know our relationship uh, you know with the United States, and one of the um, was always sort of clear that in, in looking to improve that, we also had to be sure and you know to take account of the effect that that it had to improve in a way that um, uh, Australia was comfortable with and Australia saw benefit from. Uh, and I think the way in which over a long period of time New Zealand's worked deliberately at that, um, it was has borne fruit with the Washington and Wellington declarations, which are the, essentially the foundations now of the current relationship, and was evident um, as recently as two or three weeks ago when uh, Vice President Biden was in Auckland, and you know announced um, essentially that a U.S. and a Navy ship would. Um, would go to New Zealand for the um, 75th anniversary of our um, of our Navy. Um, so, uh, and I think bo again, both of us have um, taken you know different um, uh, roads to, to to thinking and thinking our way through um, through uh, China and how we engage with with China, the sort of relationship that we want. Um, but you know, New Zealand is um, you know while it's sort of very alert to um, International, the, inter, the narrative of our, of our partners on uh, on China, our own, you know, we, we, we make our own decisions and we and we prom and we promote and prosecute um, our views, um, you know, in our own way. Um, but I don't think that uh, there's any, you know there's any doubt that um, we you know we in Australia have have a very sort of you know similar view um, of of the region and the bits of the. Um, uh, the international sort of framework which need to be applied to making that region work well, be safe and work, and be secure. Do we have a, a last question for the ambassadors? Yeah. So I'll um, end with asking the question I think that has become very popular probably to ask. Um, Without being too flippant, um, what is the contingency plan of each one of your countries um, if Donald Trump is elected president? <laughs> the contingency what, plan. What are you going to do if Donald Trump is elected president? I don't know if that's the right word, president. but that's sort of. <clears throat> Well, you'll I've been you'll following. Be hosting, uh, you'll, be host, you'll be hosting him in APEC. Um, <laughs> yeah, in two, two years' time. I've been following that very. Uh, carefully at CNN for my own personal <laughs> education rather than representing my country. Um, I, it's difficult to say really um, for us who um, think, uh, you, you know, you think from your own personal political um, uh, perspective, uh, be different from when you put it in the context of what's happening in the world <clears throat> and the trends of politics, including Australia and uh, Euro, uh, Britain's Brexit. And you, you had a few days ago Farage uh, talking in, um, 
Trump, uh, Trump's campaign. Personally, let me tell you this, I don't like Trump. <laughs> me neither. <Frankly>. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't know what my country's response would be. Uh, my deputy, who's a Highlander, loves Trump. They all like people. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, oh, he's, he's going to win. So in Papua New Guinea, you would have probably in the Highlands, they love and admire Trump. For us coastal peaceful people, we have a different view. <laughs> That's, I'll leave that at that. Thank you. Pagnajib? <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, Trump, uh, uh, the voice of Trump of today is the campaign of uh, Trump uh, to be the president of the United States. He used that everything, every effort uh, for uh, the benefit of his uh, presidency. But I think he will change. This is uh, my, my personal opinion. And also I uh, read some uh, articles in uh, Indonesian newspapers that uh, uh, the pessimist is uh, uh, no longer that, that pessim pessimistic. You know? So it's a, it's a growing uh, number also the people in Indonesia to see uh, the pos uh, maybe not the positive side, but uh, the uh, more optimist more optimist side, because uh, uh, it's it's not possible uh, for United States you know to bring up this uh, this voice this kind of uh, 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 well uh, uh, we can say. Uh, motto, which is uh, you know, which is uh, uh, too different to the uh, very basic principles and philosophy of the United uh, States, and I think uh, uh, he will change when he become a president. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess it'll be tricky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It'll be tricky, but um, you know, part of navigating it, I guess, it's, it's why um, you know people are investing time and in thinking about whether you're going to be an international economist or involved in international economics or a diplomat or an invest in the sort of defence and security commentariat. Um, it certainly you know, won't be short of um, you won't be sh short of business. Um, and so I think that it will, um, you know, it sort of <coughs> forces you to think about, um, first in a his historical sense. I mean, there's been these sorts of shocks before. I mean, you know, and. Uh, um, Brendan talked about saying bed different nightmares, which is another way of describing always for New Zealand the great risk, the great sort of um, nightmare for us is economic marginalisation, um, which we've lived through in um, uh, sort of my, in, in my professional career. Um, when you think about being, to, you know, the EU, uh, Britain joining the EU and um, some of the sort of shocks that flowed from that. Um, when you think about um, the GFC. But, and so the, the things which allow you to navigate it are the, the way in which you are organised as a country, the coherence of your sort of political narrative and the strength of your institutions. Um, the way in which you navigate it are the, um, the sorts of relationships that you have, the architecture which supports them, the narrative which runs alongside it, and the sort of personal connectivity which, um, it, which keeps it contemporary. Um, and you, you know, you, you then sort of um, think about the way in which um, you use those sort of state, those state resources to, to, you know, to manage a change of, of that magnitude. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, the, the U.S. will still be the biggest economy in the world. Um, the U.S. will still have, um, you know, so at its heart, will have so much of the energy and the drive, which will, um, you know, be fundamental to us. So, you know, part of the Part of our job will be to understand that and to you know and to manage um, manage against it. It's why, for example, in our case, um, uh, you know, we when we think about our indispensable you know relationship with Australia, when we think you know we think about um, uh, how we manage um, we manage that in terms of the the ecosystem of connectivity from political leaders to business to you know, sport, media, name any part of it, how, how all that sort of fits together. Um, we think about um, the way in which you, you make sure that it's actually focusing or dealing with, with contemporary issues and you think about the sort of narrative which supports it, including the work that a high commission does or you know, a government does in, in, in revaluing all the time that relationship and making the proposition about why we matter. Um, and so I think all of us will, you know, be doing the same thing with the U.S. if a, if a Trump presidency turns up. Thank you. 
Thank you all. Can you all join me in, uh, in thanking their excellencies?